5 a.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. Today, the House Forests and Forest Health Subcommittee held a hearing on the National Fire Plan. Montana Governor Judy Martz and a number of other officials testified about the conditions of U.S. wildlands and federal readiness to fight fires on them. Colorado Representative Scott McGinnis chairs the hearing. It's a little over an hour and a half. That's, I want to get your testimony. It's also my understanding that uh, uh, members of the, uh, that uh, aren't too pleased with today's procedure will file a number of stalling motions over on the House floor, so we'll have a series of votes. Uh, under those circumstances, Governor, I'd like to have you testify when more members of the panel are here but uh, if we do that, I'm afraid that you probably won't get an opportunity to testify. So I'm going to uh, skip over initially here any kind of opening statement on my behalf and on behalf of the uh, ranking committee member. Governor, welcome to our committee. We appreciate it. I'll let you proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, it, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the record, I am Governor Judy Martz. I'm here today representing the Big Sky State of Montana. It is an honor to be here today to testify on behalf of my state and the Western Governors Association regarding the National Fire Plan. I want to thank the chairman for his interest in an issue that's critical and of great importance to those of us in the West, and that is forest health. Please consider the uh, testimony in its entirety that I have given to you. And let me begin by saying that those of us in Montana are pleased with the prospects of the National Fire Plan. For the first time in nearly a decade, the National Fire Plan offers a ray of hope for our nation's forests. While the smoke has cleared from one of the most devastating fires in our history, we must remain vigilant in our efforts to minimize future devastating fires. Already in Montana, at this time, we fear that the potential exists for another significant fire season. I will not refer to the charts again that I have, uh, have placed here today but I did want you to see just some of the devastating headlines and what was happening in Montana. And as I just looked at those headlines, it brought me back to the fire season last year, and there's something very devastating that happened. This picture I think everyone in this room is, is familiar with, of the elk down in the fire as, as, they, um, as the elk were displaced by the fire. This happened to a lot of our wildlife, but thankfully someone caught the picture, and you've seen it, you've all seen it now has, having been made into a pin so we can be a constant, or it's a constant reminder of the displacement of the wildlife. Drought continues in Montana, and the consequences of an extended drought impose even the greater fire danger for this coming year. In the interior west, the wildfires of 2000 burned nearly 7 million acres. Of the nearly 7 million acres, 900,000 acres in Montana were reduced to ash. 300 homes were destroyed and nearly 6,000 were threatened. We had over 20 communities evacuated as a result of an out of control wildfire. While we cannot prevent drought, lightning strikes, heat or wind, we can prevent some of the devastating impacts that result from mismanagement and inaction. We must manage our national forests. Hands off is not management. We have successfully excluded fire from our landscape for the past 90 years. And while the Forest Service was quick to respond, the fires start across our nation, an action plan for forest management sat on the shelf. Entire watersheds and landscapes have grown dense with small trees and brush, creating unnatural and unhealthy condition, ripe for catastroph catastrophic fires. In fact, the General Accounting Office, in a report requested by this subcommittee, identified nearly 40 million acres of national forest land at risk of catastrophic fire within the interior west. Last summer, we burned in Montana less than 10 percent of the average acreage identified by the GAO. Instead of focusing on how much timber we harvest, we need now to focus on how much we leave on the land. Instead of focusing on acres harvested and board feet processed, we need to focus on the overall health of the forest ecosystem. Some of our forests have grown dense and have accumulated large amounts of hazardous fuels, making it nearly impossible to prescribe burn. In cases such as this, man needs to mimic the purpose of fire by cleaning or clearing overgrown and overaccumulated fuels. Only after successful restoration can we introduce fire in its natural form. 
the national fire plan offers a full range of forest management tools from prescribed burn to mechanical treatment state and local governments are active participants the forest service will allow nine operating principles guiding their work to implement the national fire plan and i'm encouraged by those principles frankly that are outlined and look forward to working with the forest service on implementing those principles in montana last summer's fires affected private and state lands as well in montana we saw over fourteen thousand acres of state forest burn recognizing that value of burnt dead timber decreases rapidly with time our department of natural resources the dnrc moved in an environmentally sound and fiscally responsible manner dnrc quickly evaluated the affected resources in accordance with the montana environmental policy act similar to nepa and prepared a plan to treat the areas most severely impacted by fires today the state has completed ninety percent of the treatment plan on fifty four hundred acres of state land this treatment plan has rehabilitated many of the burned acres and generated three point seven million dollars for a public education system the harvests were also conducted while adhering to the letter of the state forest land management plan which is to manage for biodiversity and forest health in effect similar to USFS ecosystem management philosophy to date the United States Forest Service in Montana has not removed any timber affected by the fires of last summer. And I ask, why? Additionally, the treatment plan addressed rehabilitation measures that include soil stabilization measures, stream bank stabilization, and reseeding wherever it's necessary. This summer, the state will begin the process to evaluate and address necessary treatment for the areas less impacted by the fires. My point is simple. If the state of Montana can move in a timely, environmentally sound, and fiscally responsible manner with limited resources, should we not expect our federal neighbors to do the same? We need them to do the same. I would like to present the balance of my testimony now on behalf of the 21 members of the Western Governors Association, of which I recently became a member. Since last summer's fires, states have been working collaboratively with federal agencies and other stakeholders to develop a national 10-year stra strategy to reduce the risk of wildfires. The governors of the Western Governors Association requested this strategy and Congress concur on the need for a long-term approach in the FY 2001 Interior Appropriations Report. A draft of that strategy for public and congressional comment is appended to my, my testimony. We are aiming to complete it by May the 1st. I encourage Congress to remain vigilant in improving the health of our nation's forests. We must be dedicated to long-term strategy that addresses the health of our forests and reduces the risk to our population. And we must fully fund the National Fire Plan. The goals set by the National Fire Plan are crucial to minimizing threat to lives and to property in our entire region. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Governor, the panel appreciates the uh, effort that you made to travel clear across the country to make your presentation later in the hour or in the meeting we intend to have the Forest Service. I'm pretty positive about some of the steps that they've taken. There are a couple comments that stand out in your comments that you've made. Uh, in particular, your comment that hands-off is not management. Uh, that puts it, uh, uh, you label it directly. That's exactly correct. You also said that to date the United States Forest Service in Montana has not removed any timber affected by the fires of last summer. And I think what's of interest, Governor, is you compare it to what your State Department of Forest Service uh, has done in comparison. It's clear that uh, one agency is able to move on a much more rapid basis than the other agency. Yeah. Considering the uh, fire, or fire potential that we have out there, it's important that we move on an expedited basis, not a careless basis, not a reckless basis, but an expedited basis. And I think that we're, uh, we're headed that direction. I think the, uh, your point that, that the state of Montana can move in that, and you've set a good example for us, is uh, well, the kind of thing we need to hear back here. Uh, Governor, as you'll remember, at the beginning of the meeting, we waived opening remarks because of the fact we wanted to get your testimony in, and I want to allow as much questioning as possible. In lieu of that, I'll uh, waive the remainder of my time and yield to the ranking member for a couple comments and uh, members we will go to the five minute uh, question rule uh, yield my time to the ranking member and welcome the ranking member thank you mr chair and i really uh, 
won't have too much of a comment here. Should we move to some questions here? The governor, is that appropriate? appropriate? Great. Thanks for giving us again, Governor. This is twice in two days. You're doing your woman's service, so we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just I'm going to ask you a real broad question, if I can, and feel free to philosophize or rhapsodize at, at, at your, your pleasure. Um, and I'll go right to the heart of a, a controversy that we'll be talking about or something that can be controversial in this issue, and that is the need in certain instances to remove fuel from the forest, which in certain instances needs to be done because of our previous fire suppression policy has allowed a tremendous growth to some degree in, in fuel. But in doing so, many of our constituents have concerns that any uh, fuel suppression program could end up as a masquerade uh, for, in fact, an increase in commercial harvest that was really motivated not so much by fuel suppression, but rather that is simply to, to increase harvest levels uh, where the law, ESA, and various other restrictions may not allow it. I'd just like your thoughts on, on how you think we can structure or should consider structuring a program to avoid that second possibility of disguised commercial harvesting, if you will, under the guise of fuel suppression, uh, while still you know, reaching that goal. And feel free to give us your thoughts, even if you haven't gone all the way through. Thank you very much, Congressman. I really believe that uh, within my heart, I think what we're trying to do is talk about healthy forests. And if we consider that and keep the argument of, of timber harvest as being a jobs related or a creating a jobs for the industry out of this, we will look truly at creating a healthier forest. And that's what we've been saying for years in Montana. The fuels are laying there. They're laying dead. You can't, trees can't even grow to the size they should grow. Thinning is better for forests. We're finding that out for sure. And I really think that um, for the ecosystem, the argument is that we really need to do, we need to leave some of that, uh, that dead and burnt timber. But how do we do that in an environmentally and ecologically safe way? And, and I think that's got, you need to continually take the harvesting or, or the removal out of the picture, but start to look and really concentrate and focus in on the reasons we want to do this. And the reasons we want to do it in Montana is to have a healthy forest. Our fires last year, as you know, were so large. We had the best firefighters in the world there. And to sit in the same room with them and hear them say, these are too hot, we cannot put them out. Flames flashing over 300 feet in the air and there was no way because of the, the hot box that sat, sat underneath them. Now we're faced with different problems, erosion, uh, watersheds, uh, those kinds of things. So for a healthy forest, we must take away the equation. The equation, yes, is going to bring some timber harvest, and we must be diligent to get that out of there. But the first and main concern in the argument that we need to keep focused on is a healthy forest. Uh, let me ask you, um, I you said something to the effect of wanting to remove the issue of harvest from this debate. I want to make sure I understand you. I think I have many constituents who basically are looking for a level of trust in a decision-making process. What they want to have is trust that a decision to remove any, any fiber or timber from the forest in this, in this, under this program in fact, would be done for a fire suppression purpose rather than for a purpose of, although it may be laudable at times, job creation, uh, profit creation, commercial harvest. Could you suggest to us ways in fashioning this program which would help build that trust in the public? And let me just give you an example of some things that I've heard tossed about as far as ideas. I've heard tossed about of, of having a maximum uh, you know, diameter of, of tree that can be removed. I've heard it tossed about that you limit actual commercial use or sale of, of, the, of the timber. Uh, I've heard ideas tossed about that would affect artificially restrict the removal of the timber for, for, um, for commercial purposes. What could you suggest to us that would give confidence to the public on how we would structure such a program in that regard? First of all, you can't fool yourself. There will be jobs in this, and there will be tree harvest. There has to be, or else all of the dead, burnt, standing timber right now is going to be diseased. And, and, and each of those trees, depending on what kind of uh, tree they are, is a very limited time before they disease. Now, we can't have a diseased forest either, because that then, as new growth comes in, we start to build another tinder box. 
So you do have to do removal. When we did our state lands, Congressman, we, we have to designate how many of those, t those uh, trees and what diameter they are to be left standing. So in the prognosis of how you go forward, you do by prescribing what you want to have standing in that. You, uh, we have, we have uh, through the Western Governors Association, have what we believe concentrating on what we want to see. We have a list of goals and outcomes. And this is just in draft form. So as soon as it's, it's in its final form, we'll get this to you. We have several recommendations on the outcomes and what we believe we need to do. But to, to, um, to get confidence in the general public, I think we have to be very honest. There are going to be some jobs in this, but that's not our main focus. Our main focus is to get the dead timber out of there so it doesn't disease, then create another hot box in, in a several years, which it will do. As that undergrowth grows up again, we may have a, a predicament this summer in Montana that will cause us to not be able to get back into the forest again. If, if we continue in the drought that we're having right now, we may not be able to get in. If we don't get those trees out early that are dead standing, we may not be able to get into the forest because of the fire danger again. So I think, I think we just have to be honest with them for one thing. That's the greatest thing. Thank you. You're welcome. Governor, I might point out before I yield to the next member that I agree with the gentleman from Washington in regards that we don't want to use this fire policy as a guise to sneak in commercial right. logging. On the other hand, Governor, we don't want to use this as a tool or a vehicle to prevent logical scientific logging. If we have timber in there that we need to harvest for forest health, it is beyond me why we wouldn't go ahead and offer it for commercial uh, sale instead of, I guess, stacking it up somewhere and burning it and so on. Uh, I will yield to the uh, gentleman from Tennessee. Governor, I was present in 1998 when we had a hearing in which they warned us about these fires and that they were coming. And then again in early 2000, in, in the GAO report that you mentioned with the warning that there were 40 million acres in the West in, ca in immediate uh, danger of catastrophic forest fires. And then we saw those warnings that we received as early as 1998 come true. And I remember reading one article that there had been $10 billion worth of damage from this uh, roughly 7 million acres that you mentioned burned. And if, if I had gone out there and set fire to, to with uh, some matches or, or whatever to that, even a few acres, I probably would have been put in jail. And yet these policies that we followed resulted, uh, uh, the policies that I think we followed because of radical or extremist environmentalists who seemingly don't want us to cut a single tree any place. And somehow, though, they've gotten the, uh, they've almost brainwashed the children in this country because I, I think if I went to any school in Knoxville, Tennessee and told them I was opposed to cutting a single tree in the national forests, I'd probably get applause. And, and they, uh, somehow uh, people seem to have the idea that the national forests are our national parks. And nobody's advocating going in logging in the national parks. And I don't know, uh, uh, I agree with the chairman on most things, but I'm not opposed to commercial logging. People have to th uh, think that if we don't have some commercial logging a few places in this country, people aren't going to be able to build affordable houses or furniture or uh, have toilet paper or books or whatever. How do we get the message out that to have healthy forests, we need to cut some trees, and to have low prices for all these products that we want, we've got to cut some trees. And if people stop all logging, you're going to drive up prices and you're going to destroy jobs. How do we get this message out? Because we're, uh, we seem to be, I think, losing in some ways on this. And I'm not sure that I, that I can answer how we get it out. We try very hard in Montana. Uh, we have what's called best management practices that they use in the forests where they're only able to cut so many trees in a certain area. They can't cut within so many feet of the watershed. Um, there, it's, it's very strict guidelines on how they do cut. For us to pretend that we don't want to have the jobs, that's ludicrous. We need the jobs. The health of the forest depends on those people bringing them out, but bringing it out in a scientifically conscientious manner. But when we talk about that, it almost seems like we're shifting the focus to the jobs it creates when we really need to concentrate 
in a sense, we did put the fire, we did start those fires. In 1998, we came up with a plan where we knew better and we didn't really do it. Now we know better because we're seeing the ramifications of that and we need to do it. And I think education, continually educating, if we can, if you go see a cut, it doesn't look pretty when it's being done. The, uh, when they harvest, it doesn't look pretty because you have the stump. But you go back a year later and the new growth and you'll see new seedlings coming up. That's pretty and it's, it's usable. Cattle can graze there and they don't hurt the, the ecosystem. They can't graze there probably the first year, especially after prescribed burn, but they can go on there and graze within the next two years and you have a healthy forest again. So I think education is key to what we're doing in sync with the, the process that we're using to have a better managed forest. I, I remember reading in the Knoxville News Sentinel that in 1950, that 39% of Tennessee was in forest land and by 1990, it was up to 45%. And today, sure. it's about half of Tennessee's 27 million acres is in forest lands. And then I read in the Christian Science Monitor where just about every eastern state, the amount of forest land has gone up significantly over the last 50 years, yet very few people uh, realize that. And I mentioned yesterday in this hearing that uh, the Congress passed in the mid-80s this uh, law that was hailed by the environmentalists that we wouldn't cut more than 80 percent of the new growth in our national forests. Yet today, we're cutting less than one-seventh of our new growth. And what it, I think it is, some of these groups can't raise money unless they keep uh, raising the bar and scaring people and say, uh, t convincing people that we're raping the environment and doing all of these horrible things when really we're, we've made great, uh, huge strides, and in fact, we're not even cutting enough trees to keep these forest fires from happening. I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much. Governor, those buzzes, excuse me, Governor, those buzzes you heard obviously were a vote, indication of a vote. We'll be getting a couple more. It appears to me we probably will only have time for one more set of questions. I would request that the remaining panel members who have not, will not have an opportunity to ask those questions to you be allowed to submit those questions in writing to your staff uh, for response back. Uh, we also appreciate the courtesy of you coming after this next set of questions. Um, I do not anticipate that we will be back here for probably a half an hour. I would ask the other people to stay, certainly the second panel, your testimony is very important. We intend to continue the hearing, but at that point I understand you need to keep with your schedule, Governor. So. Let's wrap it up. As you'll see, Colorado pretty well dominates this committee. Uh, and uh, that's by choice. Uh, but the, the fine congressman from the state of Colorado, Mr. Udall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Governor. And uh, uh, it's uh, important that you're here today to share with us your perspectives on uh, Montana's approach to this. The um, uh, Colorado delegation last year uh, in the person of Congressman Heff, who's chairing a, another subcommittee of this large full committee uh, right now. And myself introduced a bill uh, that would have applied to the lands in Colorado in the so-called red zone. That's the urban wildland interface. And that's where we've had the most pressure on our forests, and in fact, where we had a couple of the catastrophic fires last year. And our emphasis has been on uh, focusing there to educate the people who live in those areas, but also to do the kind of uh, fuel reduction and forest health work that would save lives, save property, <coughs> and save uh, people from the heartaches that come when these fires get out of control. Is it your sense that, uh, uh, I'm not trying to lead you in this, but that, that this be the kind of a policy that we uh, first implement with these monies and with this uh, large-scale program that uh, we now have before us? It is, and, and could I just tell you what some of these recommendations from the Western Governors, and I think they'll line up with what you're thinking. <coughs> we believe that we must reduce the risk and consequences of catastrophic uh, wildfire and increase public and firefighter safety to improve conditions of fire adapted ecosystems to make them more resilient, to promote local action by increasing public understanding and providing the tools to enhance local responsibility. We need to maintain and enhance community health economic and social well-being, increase resources for protection capabilities. We need to provide the restoration and rehabilitation of fire-damaged lands and to enhance collaboration, coordination among all levels of government 
and stakeholders for joint planning, decision making, and implementation. And I think there's something further that needs to be entered into the discussion at some time is when people build in these areas where the trees right, are right up to their houses, maybe local planning or, or planning on, on uh, federal and state land, they have to have their own buffer zone, put that in before they can build of so many feet that before a, a timber can be right on top of the house. Mm -hmm. I think something has to be looked at in that way too because we spend millions of dollars fighting fire over one home and is that fair to every taxpayer? I don't know. Thank you for that response. I want to associate myself with my colleague from Washington, Mr. Inslee, when he uh, discussed the concerns that some of us share that we, we don't put the cart before the horse and that in the end this approach is about making our forests healthy. I would tell you when you talk to the environmental community, who I think is very well intentioned and understands that forests are part of our economic base in the West, that we sell our views and our recreation as well as uh, the commodities that we bring off the public lands, that when you say forest health to those communities, they think that means clear cutting. When you say sustainable forest, which is what the environmental community tends to use as their approach, the commodity interests and, and other economic interests thinks that means lock up the forest, nobody ever has any access. And I think we've got to work to find some additional common ground here, understanding that in the end we all want the same thing, which is healthy forests that are going to provide for our families in, in uh, recreational amenities, in the views and the experiences we all enjoy in the West and the out of doors, but also where appropriate would allow for uh, uh, access to those wood products. I also think we have an enormous opportunity, and you mentioned leaving some of this material in the forest because it's needed the forest to regenerate themselves. But with the emerging energy crisis, we had a hearing yesterday, but there's a whole uh, industry emerging around biofuels. And a lot of this small diameter material uh, can be used with the, new, the emerging technologies to produce ethanol. It's a cellulosic ethanol. And uh, I hope that we will look at that as a potential uh, uh, fe uh, feedstock for ethanol uh, production so that we become more uh, independent and we don't have the national security issues that are tied to our dependence on foreign oil. What, I'm not giving you much chance to comment, but uh, I also, the last qu question I would ask you is, in our bill, uh, Mr. Hefley's in my bill, we included a 12-inch diameter limit. Now, some people think that's too big. Some people think that's too small, but we felt it was important to begin uh, with a standard and at least put something on the table. I'm curious if you have a, have a reaction to that particular size limit for cutting. And again, this would be in the red zone in this urban wildland interface. We have designated in Montana certain, uh, it may be nine, it may go to 12, but you have to leave so many of those standing. I mean, it doesn't mean that you leave every one of them that are 12 inches in diameter standing it would mean you leave so many in a certain area for a healthy forest. Uh, we, we call it best management practices, and you're calling it something else, but we, we're talking about the same thing, managing it in a, in a viable way that's good for the ecosystem, is good for the ground, good for everything that's around it. Uh, I want to go back to the ethanol use. We are considering everything in the way of ethanol use in the state of Montana to the extent that we're looking at building an ethanol plant there right now. The legislature is looking at a couple of bills and so that's something that um, we're, we're seriously considering. We'd, we'd like to work with you through the uh, Renewable and Energy Efficiency Caucus in the House, which has 180 members in both parties and is very interested in ethanol maybe being a transition fuel to what I think eventually may be a fuel cell economy over the next right. 50 to 100 years. It's Thank good. you In very fact, much. the next state car I have will use both ethanol and it's, it's a good start. Excellent. Uh, Governor, again, we're going to have to uh, conclude our testimony temporarily. There are a Thank couple of things that I would point out. First of all, I do want to make note that there's some danger into getting into specific measurement of diameters. I mean, you may have a species who's not na that is not natural. Federal bureaucracy, and I think our bureaucracy is pretty clearly demonstrated in our lack of movement as compared to your state forest service, which, by the way, in my opinion, are closer to the soil than the federal agency is at any rate. I wish uh, that we could continue this meeting because I'm sure you'd be interested in the follow-up uh, uh, panel. Mr. Leverty and Mr. Hartzell, uh, we're going to hire 4,000 new fire firefighters. I think our communication with your state, with all the states on these fires, will be enhanced. I think some very positive news will be held in the rest of the hearing. I understand that uh, you need to go. We certainly need to go vote. I appreciate the courtesy and the safe travels home. Thank you Thank very you. much.
Committee will reconvene after the vote. could uh, be seated. Also, just as a reminder, no sell your phones in the uh, room, please. As the uh, committee knows, we've been delayed by a vote. Uh, I think, however, we can wrap up the second panel. I would ask members to uh, submit their opening statements for the record. I also have a statement to submit for the record. Is it from Denny Reberg? Yeah, 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 yes. From uh, Congressman uh, Reberg. With that, we'll call up the second panel. Mr. Hartzell, thank you for attending today. Lyle, thank you for coming out. I'm familiar with both of them. I appreciate the uh, effort. I'm very excited to, to hear your testimony. Uh, we had a visit the other day for the rest of the people in the room, which I thought was uh, very interesting. I think we're focusing on fire control, whether we discuss biomass or whether we discuss the hiring of new firefighters. Communication, of course, is a key. Is as uh, the two gentlemen know, I was on Storm King Mountain when Storm King Mountain blew up. That was not a result of bad forest health. That was a result of poor communication, unfortunate weather, dry conditions, and a lightning storm. So needless to say, not all efforts in fighting forest fires necessarily pertain to the uh, management of that particular forest. Communication is critical. And we had a good discussion the other day. I hope that uh, one of the two gentlemen will mention that uh, in coordination of firefighting. That was a, a major contributing factor to the fatalities that we suffered on the mountain during that fire. So with that, I'll turn it to the ranking member very quickly for a comment, and then we'll turn it over to our two witnesses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. I'll just my comments is brief. Uh, it is my belief that we face the prospect of a firestorm in the West this summer. It is my belief that the current budgetary projections will leave us grievously short of resources to deal with this. And if that occurs, it probably will not be the two witnesses' fault in this regard. It will be the U.S. Congress's and the White House, and that I'm going to look forward to your helping us figure out what uh, decisions need to be in a budgetary basis to allow you to do your job to keep this natural disaster from occurring in the West this summer. Now, with concurrence from the ranking member, or without objection from the ranking member, I'm going to waive the five-minute rule because I think both of your presentations, number one, are absolutely critical, and two, uh, based on what I've seen, will take longer than five minutes. You bet. Uh, why don't we, uh, whichever gentleman, uh, Lyle, you want to start off? Oh, well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's, uh, it's truly an honor to be here and I have a chance to share with you uh, this morning actions that we're taking regarding implementation of the, uh, of the National Fire Plan. Uh, I'm here today along with uh, Tim Hartzell to, uh, to bring you up to date on what uh, has been accomplished thus far and perhaps more importantly what we will be doing this summer to implement the uh, provisions of the National Fire Plan. As uh, the governor really eloquently uh, addressed the, uh, the fire season of 2000 uh, certainly captured the attention of American people on the need to find ways on protecting life and property and at the same time minimizing losses to uh, natural resources. On um, September 8th, the, the two secretaries uh, issued a report entitled Managing the Impact of Wildfires in Communities and the Environment. And uh, that report, which has been referred to as the National Fire Plan, <coughs> contains a series of recommendations to reduce the impacts of uh, wildland fires on rural communities and ensure that we do, in fact, have sufficient firefighting resources in the future. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, implementation of this uh, National Fire Plan is well underway, and we've made significant progress to date. Cooperation between the, uh, the federal agencies, the governors, and the collaboration with the tribes and local communities uh, probably 
is uh, beginning to set a new standard, a new model of how government can work, in fact, responding to the needs of uh, the people of this great country. We clearly recognize there's many challenges to uh, complete the significant increased workload that has been uh, designed as part of this plan. Long term, it's going to take many, many years of a continued commitment and investment of resources to effectively reduce the impacts of wildland fire on rural communities. And if there's a theme that we'll share with you over and over and over again, it's that this is a long-term journey. If, uh, one or two or three years will not do it. And uh, we need to uh, be able to ensure that we're, we're in this for the long term, but at the same time that we're responsible with the resources that are given. Even though it's early in the year, we've made uh, really a good start in in some uh, major areas of accomplishment. Uh, we have, in fact, treated over 80,000 acres of uh, some of the areas that were damaged during the 2000 fire season. We've uh, restored uh, 713 miles of road. Uh, we've treated about 245 miles of, of trail. And uh, we're doing those emergency um, actions to protect those resources. We have already reduced uh, fuels on over 400,000 acres on the National Forest of that uh, 1.8 million acres that we plan to treat this year. We've been involved uh, collectively in, in terms of hiring the resources to staff the fire organizations. and We've uh, hired over 850 new permanent firefighters. We expect to hire another 1,900 additional firefighters bef uh, before um, April 30th. In addition, we plan to acquire new engines, new fire engines. We are going to bring new equipment un under contract and uh, you know, begin to staff the organization to be responsive to what we know is a uh, potential for another fire season. We've already started the, uh, the process in providing funding and training and equipment to over 4,000 volunteers just on the Forest Service side. We've published uh, a list of the communities that are at risk, uh, which was uh, prepared by the, uh, the Western Go or by the national governors and the tribes to begin to uh, start the discussion on how can we begin to more effectively target and focus our, our fuels uh, reduction projects on those communities that are at greatest risk. We've initiated uh, action on over 63 research projects, which what I would uh, consider to be uh, the uh, intellectual mutual fund in terms of how are we going to begin to acquire new knowledge about uh, the effects of fire and uh, these actions on resources in this country. We've developed a framework that the governor referenced in terms of uh, a draft of a national 10-year comprehensive strategy with the states and the tribes as full partners four partners in the implementation of the National Fire Plan. It's uh, very, very significant. Our success to date, uh, beginning with the, uh, the definition of the wildland urban interface communities, the hiring of firefighters, and the ongoing rehabilitation of uh, and restoration of burned areas, uh, firewise education work, is evidence of the strong start. We're committed to increasing the nation's firefighting capability and to protect communities and restore resources. But it's going to take longer than a year. After my uh, partner, Tim Hartzell, uh, uh, presents his remarks, uh, we're going to take a few minutes to expand on the key points and uh, add some additional specifics and then answer any questions that you or any of the members of the committee might have. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity just to share with you uh, some great results that we'll, we'll pick up a little bit more. Thank you, Mr. Hartzell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Tim Hartzell, and I am the Director of the Office of Wildland Fire Coordination in the Department of Interior. I really appreciate this opportunity to address the committee concerning a natural resource effort that is, frankly, historic in its scope and unprecedented in both its innovation and collaboration, that is, implementation of the National Fire Plan. I'm pleased to report uh, to you that the Department of Interior firefighting agencies have already made significant and substantial progress in responding to the mandate and opportunity that Congress has given us in the appropriation language for fiscal year 2001 to minimize the occurrence of another fire season such as 2000, to lessen the danger to communities at risk, and to restore ecosystems and the natural role of fire to protect our critical natural resources, and most important, to keep our firefighters and public safe. We're pleased to speak to you about this historic initiative uh, that's truly a new approach to solving resource management problems. Uh, the key to our initial success has been our, in our openness uh, and our desire to work with states, local governments, and others as full and equal partners in identifying and finding solutions to problems. I certainly hope that this is a clear message 
uh, that uh, you uh, hear throughout our testimony. At this time, I would like to forego the balance of my submitted testimony so that my colleague and I can focus on the critical actions and that we have completed to date under the National Fire Plan and talk to you about uh, future actions and opportunities under the plan. With that, I would like to call your attention to the five key points in the National Fire Plan, which we have up on the poster board. Uh, those are firefighting, rehabilitation and restoration, hazardous fuels management, community assistance, and accountability. And we would now like to spend a little bit of time talking to you about each of those key elements of the plan. The first component that I'd like to talk about is firefighting and tell you um, what we have done from an interior perspective to date. Firefighting is that component of the National Fire Plan that enables us to be adequately prepared to prevent, detect, and initially attack wildfires. Uh, to date, the Department of Interior has been successful in hiring 875 new employees. We have um, committed $30 million to reconstructing and repair, repairing over 50 facilities. Facilities are necessary to provide and meet minimum standards for crew quarters, to provide housing, adequate housing for our engines, and to provide helitac bases. In addition, we have ordered a significant uh, amount of equipment, including contracting of 24 helicopters, uh, requesting 62 engines, six bulldozers, a variety of uh, crew transport uh, uh, vehicles, and eight water tenders. Uh, in addition, uh, I think it's important, Mr. Chairman, since you mentioned Storm King Mountain, that with the uh, additional firefighters that we are hiring, that training is going to be a key issue for us. And we will put no firefighter in a position uh, uh, where they have not had adequate training on, on basic firefighting and behavior, standards for survival, and the importance of communication under duress. We will not, uh, we will not place a firefighter in a position without adequate training. Safety is, under the National Fire Plan, job one for both our firefighters and the public. It, Mr. Chairman, in addition to the um, components that uh, Tim described in terms of the efforts that are underway in terms of the firefighting efforts, the, uh, the funding that has been provided by the Congress is incredibly unique. This is probably the first time that I can recall in Forest Service history that we have been funded at this level of uh, suppression forces and preparedness. Uh, not only does that in, install the, uh, the firefighting capability in, in a human resource, but it brings us on board with, with a lot of the equipment that Tim referred to. In addition to the engines, we're, we're making some investments in, in a number of air tanker bases across the country that, that can help us in terms of being prepared. It brings on additional helitac bases so that we can have these, uh, these resources in place in the right locations to deal with the kinds of fuel conditions that we have across the country. It's a major, major step forward, and I, I just cannot tell you how, how significant that is to both of the agencies. Uh, recruitment has been a major, major task for us. We have never hired this many people in one block in the Forest Service history that I can recall. And the fact that we're trying to recruit and fill about 5,000 positions is, is an enormous undertaking, particularly as you look at the, uh, the state of the economy. In Colorado, you can't go anywhere, but you find help wanted signs, so there are just not a lot of people you know, waiting to come to work for us. So we're, we're, we're really creative in terms of going out and holding job fairs. So we've held job fairs, uh, over 35 uh, job fairs across the country to try to recruit uh, people and identify candidates for these jobs. Uh, between us, I think we've had in excess of 15,000 applications for these jobs. So this is a major undertaking as we begin to prepare not only for this season, but uh, make that equipment in place for the long term. The, uh, the other part that Tim addressed is the, is the training and the supervisory uh, capacity in terms of how do we supervise brand new people. You know, if there's a, there's a caution that comes to my mind is that we need to make sure that, that we are making those kinds of investments in the, in the uh, supervisory skills so that we're not going to put these new firefighters in harm's way. It, it's, a, it's an enormous undertaking and uh, we're, it's another area of the coordination that's taken place between the agencies that uh, Tim and I have talked about that we're, uh, we're really focusing on how we can 
most effectively train these new people so that uh, we're not duplicating efforts and we're being as efficient as we can with these funds that have come to us. Uh, maybe we'll uh, go on to the, to the next one, which, which deals with the, uh, the restoration and, and rehabilitation of the burned areas. Uh, one of the, um, the second key area of the, of the National Fire Plan addressed the, and recognized the, the need to uh, re rehabilitate and restore these intensively burned areas from the uh, you know, fires of 2000. You can see that uh, between the two of us, we've got uh, uh, probably in excess of four to five million acres that we plan to treat. Uh, and a variety of techniques, uh, just as the, uh, the governor of Montana spoke about the restoration of rehab, uh, these, uh, these activities are well underway. Uh, we, uh, we responded back to the Congress uh, in January in terms of a framework on how we were going to prioritize projects uh, that, would, that came in for rehab and restoration. We submitted that in January and those criteria have uh, been applied. That was an interagency effort uh, between the Interior and the Forest Service. Uh, we're well underway in terms of uh, implementing uh, rehab and restoration projects. Many of those projects uh, started uh, even before the smoke was out on the ground. That uh, We started doing much of that emergency work and that's going to continue on through the summer. I should tell you that um, between the two of us, uh, the two departments, so we received about $250 million in appropriations for rehab and restoration. The, uh, the projects that came in just from the Forest Service uh, were well in excess of uh, $260 million. So there's a lot of work out there that needs to be done. Tim? I, I think it uh, may be helpful to uh, uh, mention that in the congressional report uh, on rehab, uh, we were asked to indicate uh, what criteria we would use to direct our uh, rehabilitation and stabilization efforts. Um, in summary, they were that uh, our actions would be compatible with existing land use plans. Uh, we would take a full and open look at uh, the uh, the uh, projects and alternatives to complete them. Uh, rehab would be uh, conducted in full cooperation with other partners and uh, rehab would be restricted to the within the perimeter of the burned area. I'd like to mention two important points uh, uh, regarding the rehab program that result from the National Fire Plan. Number one, we now have uh, the flexibility and the uh, opportunity to conduct rehab for up to three years after a, a, a wildfire. And uh, during that period, we can use the rehabilitation funds for replanting native shrubs, forbs, and, and grasses. And this is a significant uh, uh, addition and improvement to our rehabilitation program. One of the other areas that um, just uh, tag on to the uh, rehab and restoration recognizes the issue of noxious weeds. And uh, as we deal with noxious weeds and invasive species, uh, this is a long-term commitment. It's uh, more than just simply sending a crew out and monitoring some of these uh, disturbed areas from the fires of 2000. But it's a long-term investment if, uh, if we do in fact find species coming into these sites that uh, we're into it, uh, really a war on weeds. And uh, these uh, rehab and restoration plans recognize the importance of monitoring and aggressive action on invasive species. The, uh, the bark uh, chart that Mary has up there just kind of gives you a graphic display of the, uh, of the rehab and restoration acreage. And you can see that, uh, in, in fact, as the governor referenced this morning, that we burned in excess of 7 million acres. And uh, between the two agencies, we're, we're treating about uh, close to 5 million acres of that, the, uh, the remainder being on, on state and private lands. So, you know, this is a huge undertaking, and it cuts across not only just the federal bounties, but deals with state and private lands as well. Uh, I think at this time we should move on to our next key point, uh, the Hazardous Fuels Program. Uh, under the Hazardous Fuels Program, um, we have on the interior uh, side $195 million that's going to enable us to uh, treat almost 1.4 million acres, uh, uh, 309,000 million, 309, of those are wildland urban interface acres. Uh, uh, acres around communities that are vulnerable to wildfire. Uh, the remainder of the acres is in priority watersheds. Our hazardous fuels program concentrates on those actions uh, that we take to reduce fuel loadings and fire behavior potential, such as uh, prescribed fire or mechanical or manual thinning or chemical means or any combination of the above. I'd like to, uh, Lyle and I have a, a series of photos that we would like to share with the committee. <coughs> One uh, to um, 
give you the, uh, an understanding of the fuel problem uh, in Intermountain shrublands and another to give you uh, a sense of the problem of fuel loading uh, in our forest and timber lands. This, um, this photo, that, uh, the two photos that uh, Mary has uh, posted there shows uh, really a, a very graphic uh, representation of what's happened across the interior west in terms of fuel conditions, in terms of structure and composition of the stands. That, uh, that first uh, photo in 1871 and the same photo point uh, back in 1982 just shows the dramatic transformation that's taken place. Uh, this could be replicated literally in 100 million acres across the interior west. Uh, this is a, I, I think it's a great example of the kinds of situations that we're talking about. And as we begin to look at uh, that wildland urban interface in terms of everybody wants to live in the woods, uh, this is the kind of uh, situation that, that we're beginning to address. Let's go to the, uh, the shrub. This uh, just an, another one. Uh, this is a, a photo series that uh, many of you have seen. This represents the uh, Lick Creek area in the, the Bitterroot uh, National Forest in Montana. Uh, what, what it shows is uh, the, the changes in stand structure and composition that takes place over time. Uh, the, the 99 photo back in the, up on the upper left there uh, does in fact show some, you know, some treatment on there. But I think what's important is you look at the relative changes in terms of the numbers of stems, the composition that has taken place on that same photo point uh, over the, the next uh, 80 years. So it's, uh, it's a graphic representation of the kinds of changes that we're talking about. Not that that's a pure natural stand on the left side, but it does, in fact, uh, give us a benchmark to measure what, what has taken place. I'd like to spend a little time uh, uh, showing you a fuels uh, problem that we have uh, in, in shrublands. So this is a photograph of uh, what we would call a sagebrush steppe community in the northern Great Basin. Uh, this is, I, I would tell the community, this is probably what uh, the early explorer John Fremont saw when he, when he came through the west and he described the sagebrush plains in his writings. Uh, this uh, plant community you see right here is dominated by Wyoming big sagebrush and the grass that you see, the very healthy and lush grass you see there is blue bunch wheatgrass. What this picture shows is you hear the term healthy range or healthy lands or healthy ecosystem. This is an excellent photograph to demonstrate what healthy rangeland looks like. It has a low density of shrubs, shrub, shrubs that represent a variety of age classes, an abundance of blue bunch wheatgrass a variety of small forbs and flowers and, and ground cover. Uh, and this provides a variety of food for wildlife. Next. This is an example of what happens when a wildfire occurs in a healthy uh, shrub community. Uh, historically, these sagebrush communities burned in a mosaic uh, fashion with low fire intensities. And what you get, as you can see in the photograph, there are these pockets of unburned or lightly burned vegetation. The pockets of unburned sagebrush and grass provide a seed source uh, for, the, uh, for the burned areas within the perimeter of the fire. Typically, in these healthy sagebrush ranges, fire recycled every 50 to 100 years, and it was vital to the renewal of these communities. The next photo I've... Uh, uh, got on display for you here typifies much of what we have in many, many areas of the Inner Mountain West. Uh, this is a problem uh, that probably uh, is common somewhere between 100 to 140 million acres of uh, rangelands in the Inner Mountain West. What we have uh, when we have these hot fires is cheatgrass, which is the, the golden grass you see there forming a dense stand in, in the formerly open inner spaces between the shrubs that were inhabited by native plants. And this significantly increases the fine fuels. Now, once cheatgrass grows out, uh, usually, or dries out, usually in uh, mid-May to mid-June, it's highly flammable and it, it easily carries a fire throughout the entire shrub community. Cheatgrass in this situation entirely changes the frequency the intensity and the behavior of wild, wildfires. Uh, as a, a rancher said in 1928 in an Idaho Statesman article about cheatgrass, it grows in a day, it ripens a day, and it blows away in a day. Uh, let me just say that this site right here 
represents a site that is salvable, both from a fuels management standpoint and a rehab standpoint. However, this is a photograph that shows what happens once a sagebrush community is totally invaded by cheatgrass and that it reburns. The vegetation here, which used to be that beautiful blue bunch wheatgrass and a mixture of sage and forbs and flowers, has been totally converted to a monoculture of cheatgrass, which is an annual species, but more importantly, it's been taken over by invasive weeds. We used to think cheatgrass was the bottom of the ecologic spiral, no more. Now we have noxious weeds invading cheatgrass. Uh, I think you can all appreciate that this type of situation has uh, negative impacts on rangeland health of the site as well as its value for a variety of multiple uses. The fire cycle in this photograph probably, uh, rather than being 50 to 100 years like healthy rangeland, is probably something in the vicinity of every three to 10 years. But most importantly, those fires are considerably more dangerous for our firefighters to fight. An Oregon study found that fires in this type of range system are 500 more times likely to start and burn than in healthy native rangelands. I've got two photos here I'd like to close with on to depict the fuel system on, on conditions on our intermountain uh, brushlands. Um, this fire right here shows what was very typical throughout much of the Great Basin in 1999. You know, in five days alone in the state of Nevada, there were literally tens of thousands of lightning strikes and more than one and a half million acres were consumed in that five-day period. Uh, as one veteran engine foreman said when he was dispatched to a fire and topped the ridge, uh, dispatch said, what is your situation? He said, I don't know. Everywhere I look, there's fire and it's roaring. Um, Fires in this kind of situation are much more larger and, and much more intense than the historical norm. I'd like to leave you with an impression from this last photograph, the aftermath of these fires. Fires in these cheatgrass and weed-dominated shrublands burn at an incredible pace. Uh, it is not uncommon for these fires to consume 5, 10, or even 20,000 acres in a day. Uh, what you see there is a burn that occurred in one day. What is left behind is certainly not encouraging. To, to respond to these kinds of situations uh, between the two uh, departments, uh, our plan in the hazardous fuel component is to treat uh, together about 3.2 million acres across the country. Uh, and again, recognizing that this is a national plan, we will be treating uh, lands in the west, but as well as maintaining some of the conditions that we've been able to sustain in the east. Uh, in addition to the, to the federal land component, the Congress provided funding that has gone to the state foresters, and in addition to the federal land treatment, we expect that they'll be uh, in the neighborhood of 400,000 acres treated on state and private lands as well. So it really becomes a, a part of a system rather than just simply a federal land activity. Uh, let's go to the last one. Just a, a reference a photo. This is uh, the Clear Creek. We have um, this is a photo from, um, I think, uh, Mr. Otter's country, that uh, Mr. Simpson's country, that uh, shows uh, a little bit of uh, graphically what can, in fact, happen uh, in terms of uh, treatments and versus burned areas. You can see uh, on both the left and the right hand side of that photo uh, burned areas from the uh, season of 2000. The area in the middle was, was pre-treated. Uh, there had been some activity in there, uh, pre-commercial. I'm guessing there were some thinnings or some type of fuel activities. Uh, but it did have a prescribed fire in that center area. So we can begin to show anecdotally that we can, in fact, make a difference in terms of what happens with fire behaviors and fire effects in treated stands. Uh, not that there's one prescription for all stands, but uh, the fact that we know and that really becomes an important part of the, the investment that Congress is making in the hazardous fuels is we have a, a focus on research in terms of helping us you know, clearly identify and track the effectiveness of these investments over time. Can we, in fact, uh, by, by good scientific uh, modeling, uh, uh, replicate these activities and come back and tell you that this is a good investment? The, the other part of the hazardous fuels I would just uh, share with you that 
we've been working with the, uh, with the governors uh, following the direction in the conference report. Uh, we published a list in um, January of uh, the communities that were at, at high risk. Uh, we worked with the governors uh, across the country. We published that list, and uh, there's about 40, 4,500 communities that were identified to be at high risk that are in the vicinity of federal lands across the United States. We're currently working with the governors, with the uh, National Association of State Foresters uh, and the tribes to refine that list. And as you would expect, uh, there were, we have 48 uh, states in this uh, part of the country that uh, all interpreted the direction one way. We've got uh, 48 different interpretations. So we're working with the governors to, and the, uh, the tribes to refine that list. And uh, our direction is to republish that list in May. Along with the list of uh, revised communities will be then, you know, which of those communities do we actually have projects planned in 2001, and which uh, communities do we have projects planned for 2002. And we're working with the communities, with the states, with the governors, uh, with counties to begin to identify uh, where we should be placing, uh, framing the criteria to place those projects uh, in the out years so that recognize that we don't have enough funds to treat all communities, but we can begin to set some criteria in terms of ranking on how we're going to make those investments. Uh, it's a huge, and I say that recognizing that this is a, a monumental effort in terms of how we've been able to engage governors, tribes, counties, and a variety of interest groups in this process. And uh, I really believe that this is a, a model in terms of how we can show that we can manage America's resources in a fashion that really is responsive to the needs of people. Maybe Tim was going to. Well, Lyle, maybe before we leave uh, fuels, we ought to uh, talk to the committee about contracting. Uh, right. the, the contracting procedures that we have in place are another excellent model or example of how federal government can work together with uh, states and locals in a more efficient manner. Uh, the, the FY 2001 appropriation was very specific that we should focus as much of our fuels treatment work on uh, through the contracting process as possible. We were concerned that we needed to minimize the duplicative work uh, of agencies independently developing and, and administering their own contracts. So back in December of 2000, we called 75 to 90 interagency fuels and contracting specialists together at the National Interagency Fire Center. We invited states and tribes to that meeting. And the purpose of that meeting was to uh, sort out uh, what contracts that everybody had in place for doing fuels treatment works and work and rehabilitation work and find the the best of the best and then use those contracts as models for conducting fuels and rehab work uh, the, the the concept being uh, we would identify these model contracts we would refine them as appropriate we would get them po posted up on a website so that no matter what part of the country you were in, whether you were in Florida or Battle Mountain, Nevada, or Eastern Oregon, or Grand Junction, Colorado, if you needed to do a mechanical thinning, you could go to this website and pull down the appropriate contract and use, utilize it to complete your work rather than invest precious staff time in redeveloping a contract. The way we see this working and the model we have in place is that we've established 11 national geographic areas for contracting. Uh, and there will be a lead agency and a lead designated lead contracting officer for each of these agencies, for each of these areas. And then every agency within that geographic war area can order against the lead agency contract. Um, we believe that this process is going to have several important benefits. One, I think I've already alluded to, minimizing the time of ever, everyone developing their individual contracts, but also um, we think that uh, through this process we are going to be able to create significant opportunities at the local level for, for jobs and small communities for fuels hazard reduction and rehab work. Uh, I think that uh, the committee can expect our contracting capacity uh, both internally and externally to increase over the next few years. Right now, I can tell you that this model contracting process is up and operable in three of the 11 geographic areas, the Pacific Northwest, the Northern Rockies, and New Mexico and Northern Arizona. 
In addition to the, uh, the, to the contracting model, which has dramatically changed how we do business together, our expectation is that 50% um, of those contracts will be local awards. And uh, th this is a, a major effort as we look at trying to build capacity for the long terms and how are we going to treat uh, these, these kinds of landscapes so that we can deal with the kinds of outcomes that the governor addressed this morning. That one of the benefits will be, in fact, that we're going to employ people but the long term is that we're going to improve forest health conditions across America. So this is a this is a, a major major part of the, uh, the of the fire plan and the huge benefits that will come from this. The uh, the next key point is uh, the, the issue of community assistance, and um, this one is a fairly broad and encompassing uh, program area because these are many cases funds that go back to the uh, the states and right into the to the local communities. Uh, the the item that we've displayed is uh, uh, rural and volunteer fire assistance. And between the, uh, the Forest Service and the Department of Interior, uh, we'll be uh, providing funds and resources to uh, 4,800 volunteer fire departments across America. Uh, for any of you that have been involved in fire departments, uh, you know, most of the, the funds are done by you know, cake sales, cookie sales, and raffles, and those types of things just to buy uh, fuel for the engines. Well, these funds go to these uh, rural fire departments to provide uh, personal protective gear for the firefighters. It helps them in terms of the acquisition of equipment so that they can be in the place to respond. In most places across America, these are the people that uh, are first responders even to wildland fires. Most of those folks are trained in uh, structural fire, so these uh, funds also provide us the opportunity to work with uh, volunteer fire departments to uh, help them in terms of training so that we can put those in, in the you know, fire situation that uh, will per protect those folks from, uh, from harm. Tim? We were delighted in Interior uh, that the appropriation included uh, a new $10 million appropriation for us to uh, target uh, rural fire departments. Uh, the purpose of that um, $10 million is for us to enhance safety and strengthen the wildfire uh, protection capability of small rural fire departments and that support suppression uh, on adjacent or intermingled federal lands. Lyle talked about, uh, alluded to this, that that by uh, in, in strengthening the capability of small fire departments, we are also going to increase the overall preparedness or readiness capacity of all partners in wildland fire uh, protection. Now the dollars that we got are going to be specifically targeted to these small communities. communities uh, with a population of less than 10,000. And the money is going to be targeted for technical assist assistance, training, supplies, and for public education. Uh, the criteria for uh, small fire departments obtaining this funding are, are uh, actually just two. One, they have to have an agreement with the state forester or with directly with the Department of Interior Agency. And secondly, the rural fire department needs to be able to provide 10 percent of the cost, whether it's dollars or in-kind services, we will provide the remaining 90 percent of the funding. How these uh, rural fire departments uh, can gain access to this money will be through a standard application that we have just finished developing, uh, and that that application must also be coordinated with the state forester. Uh, in order to get the money, we have to have an agreement with the fire department outlining each partner's roles, ours and theirs, for, before the money is transferred. Uh, and we also hope to have the standard agreements uh, that each partner will enter into available on a website. Uh, I think uh, we're very excited about this. I know we're going to have some big dividends and payoffs here. It is a pilot program, and we're going to be reviewing it and monitoring, monitoring it carefully through the year and we'll make adjustments as needed. Additionally, on the Forest Service side, uh, there are funds that uh, go straight to the, uh, to the state foresters to work with uh, communities in terms of education. And uh, the, the governor uh, addressed that this morning, that uh, this becomes a very uh, integral part of the, uh, the whole fire plan, is uh, what can landowners do in terms of personal responsibility to, uh, to treat their landscapes to make them, in fact, more defensible. Uh, we, we've hosted a series of uh, what we call FireWise workshops around the country. In fact, uh, a week ago Friday, I was in uh, Cedar Edge, Colorado, and uh, with the state foresters uh, staff, the BLM staff, and the Forest Service, uh, 
we trained uh, about 50 uh, American Red Cross volunteers that that is what they're going to do. They're going to go out and work with landowners, help them make an assessment of what do they need to do on their own lands to make them more defensible. In addition, these funds provide the capacity and many times for the state foresters to work with landowners to actually do some land treatments. And uh, these are uh, really an important part of the, of the entire system. Uh, the other part of the community assistance that I uh, just talked about deals with the economic action plan. And uh, in the economic action plan, we're looking at uh, some of the ideas that, you know, what can we do with some of the small diameter material? Can we, in fact, utilize some of these uh, materials that, that you've seen uh, graphically uh, today? Can we use that to deal with some of the energy issues that we have in this country today? We believe that there are some opportunities for bioenergy. We've got some proposals. In fact, in California, we, we have received uh, probably responses in terms of 20 to 1 in terms of what we have capacity to fund versus uh, what the proposals are. Many of these are focused on what we can do with small diameter material and how we can utilize that material to deal with some of the energy needs that we have in the country. The, the last, uh, last point, perhaps the most important one for Tim and I, deals with the issue of accountability. And um, if I could leave you with a term, we're the junkyard dogs. Uh, we are passionate about uh, sharing with you very candidly that uh, we are tracking agencies' performance, we are tracking our uh, accomplishments on the ground so that we can come back to you with, uh, with full integrity and tell you that this has been a good investment. Um, we are working with, uh, with GAO to, to look at the, can we in fact design monitoring systems to, to track our performance. We have research in place that I think will help us uh, answer those questions on the, uh, the real science basis behind these investments that we're making. We've, uh, we've put together a series of uh, performance elements in, in line officers' performance standards so that we can actually hold line officers accountable for, for these accomplishments. And uh, we plan a series of uh, program reviews in the field. And uh, we have invited uh, the idea of bringing you know, legislative staff along with us to, uh, to spend time looking at the field in terms of are we asking the right questions and uh, really looking at the monitoring to see that these things are in fact meeting your expectations as well as ours. Congress has made a huge investment and uh, we believe that uh, with almost uh, two billion dollars of new money that, that we need to be uh, as open and transparent as we can in terms of uh, the tracking systems. We've invested in a, in a framework that we can probably by the end of this month we'll be able to in real time give you what's happened in each one of your states and each one of your congressional districts in terms of these projects. So it's a, it's a huge step forward. Again, it's uh, becoming a model, I think, in terms of how government can work. Tim? And uh, e each of the uh, um, departments has regularly weekly meetings to track the status of the National Fire Plan. Interior people um, uh, participate in the, the Forest Service meeting. Uh, Forest Service people participate in the interior meeting so that we are lockstep and know what each other is doing. At the Interior uh, Department, I can tell you that we have re regular weekly meetings. Uh, where our four bureau directors report directly to the chief of staff on status and progress of implementing the national fire plan. We have safeguards in place to assure that the funds are uh, only dispersed with the appropriate fund and project code and that each of the individual bureaus involved in this program has, in, has assigned a lead and co-lead for implementing the national fire plan and each of those bureaus has developed an implementation strategy document to assure that the five key points in the, uh, in the plan are carried forward. Um, also, I think we need, well, I'll probably to call the attention to the fact that I don't know how many, but we have delivered numerous reports to the Congress as required in the Appropri Appropriation Act, in addition to a very detailed financial and action plan, which we have shared with you and which we are mo monitoring diligently, and there are still several reports to come. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just uh, tell you thank you for waiving the five-minute rule. We thought we could get through this quicker, but uh, <laughs> we've got a lot to share with you. But uh, we, we truly appreciate your time and your interest in, uh, in the National Fire Plan. And uh, Tim and I would be honored to answer any questions you might have for us. Clearly, your testimony and the situation we face is critical. That's why we have taken the time this morning. I would advise the committee members as well as our guests that the meeting must adjourn at 12 noon. I expect a vote at that point in time anyway. Uh, in light of that, I would like to give an opportunity for members, each of the members, to ask a question. So I would ask the members to keep their questions abbreviated 
and to not take your full five minutes so that we can get all of the way around. In turn, I would also ask that our witnesses uh, keep your answers very brief uh, in, in consideration of that. I'll ask three quick questions. Uh, if you can give me three quick answers, then I'll go to the ranking member. What was the overall budget for these activities last year? Question number one. Question number two, how much was this increased for this fiscal year? Question number two. And question number three, what do you see happening to this level of funding in the next fiscal year? So if you could quickly respond to those three questions, then I'll yield to the ranking member. Uh, let, me, uh, let me start quickly on the Forest Service side. In, uh, in fiscal year 2000, all of the programs that dealt with the, with the fire plan, we had about $1.2 billion. Uh, in uh, 2001, the total, including the, the Title IV, brought us up to about 2.1, almost 2.2 billion. So we, we experienced almost a $1.1 billion, $1 billion increase on the Forest Service for all the programs associated with the fire plan. So uh, approximately 100 percent increase. Yes, sir. And fiscal year, the next fiscal year? Uh, fiscal year 2000. 2002 is the one. 2002. Okay. Yes. We're waiting to see. Uh, what's your proposal? We think it's going to be uh, solid. Our proposal is that we'd like to see a continuation of what we have in 2001 as a minimum. Okay. Mr. Hartzell. Uh, in, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, in, in fiscal year 2000 for the Department of Interior, our uh, uh, funding for the fire management programs was $490 million, almost $491 million. In fiscal year 2001, it was nearly uh, $978 million, uh, a $486 million increase. Uh, nearly a doubling. So another 100 percent. Well, it's clear from a bipartisan point of view that the funding of this is a high priority. The President's made it very clear that it's a high priority for him. With that, I'll yield to the uh, ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We had an earthquake in Seattle the other day, and uh, the federal government did not predict it, but we're not being critical. It, earthquakes <laughs> are somewhat difficult it's to predict. It's a different department. Right. But, um, it seems to me with the incredible uh, drought in the West, we've got up in the state of Washington, as you know, snowpacks, water levels in the, in the 50 to 60 percent level. It seems to me we have very, very clear indications this is going to be a, a severe fire season. And I'm concerned because at least the information I've received, and I'm just looking at a, a proposed budget, as I understand it, from the White House dated February 28th, that actually would reduce the total fire plan spending, as I understand, for both agencies by $500 million, which is about a 20 to 25 percent cut. Now, I understand a lot of that comes from a, uh, essentially backing out emergency fire contingency, which had occurred in previous years. But if you are to assume, as I do, that this year has every prospect of being as severe or more so than in previous years, uh, aren't we looking at a, a demand that's likely to be as much or greater? And if so, ought we not to be looking for more resources uh, in this budget cycle in advance rather than, than afterwards? Now, I understand it's difficult for you fellows in your position to talk about budget issues, but if you can talk about the threat firewise, perhaps we can get the, the sense of your drift. Uh, just, uh, just to respond, I, I believe that you know, part of the, the action that we'll be able to take as agencies with this increased uh, funding that we have in 2001, uh, we'll, we'll have, um, historically, we've been funded at about 60 to 70 percent of our, what we call the most efficient level. This, this new funding that the Congress has provided for us in 2001 will bring on additional, these 5,000 new firefighters plus the, the additional equipment. Uh, part of these fi uh, firefighters, we're going to add 12 new hotshot crews. We ran out of crews this summer. If we'd had more fires, we, in fact, in Colorado, we were at the point where we would have had to say, we're going to let this one burn and we're going to have to address this. So I think we're going to be in a much better position with increased capacity and capability for firefighting. And we've, we've been talking already about you know, how we can mobilize and move resources around strategically to deal with the, the different fuel conditions that we have across the country. So I think we're going to be there in a good position in 2001. I think for 2002, you know, we're, we're optimistic that the, uh, the President's budget is, in fact, going to help us sustain that preparedness level and, and make those levels of fuel <coughs> investment. Um, I, I, I concur with my colleague. Uh, we, we will be able to maintain uh, a level of funding that's going to help us reduce fire risk. Uh, we are going to have significantly more capacity because of the equipment we are bringing on this fiscal year that will be online, the majority of it next year. 
Uh, and in addition, we, we have and will continue to utilize uh, the option of severity funding to uh, uh, pay in advance to bring resources online to deal with uh, serious potential fire hazards such as you mentioned. Well, I appreciate your efficiency, but I have to tell you that if we end up in a fire year as we did in the last year, which I believe we're looking at this year, I can't see how even supermen would wring out 25 percent efficiencies of the federal budget. And you're looking at $500 million decreases. So I want to tell you I'm concerned about that. I'm sure there are others on a bipartisan basis are very concerned about that. And we're going to work through this project. Jumping ahead to more long-term plan, um, on a long-term issue, uh, on our issue of fuel reductions, you're engaged in a, a major effort, effort in that regard. And I think many people understand that our previously short-sighted policy of total fire suppression has, in fact, led to a major buildup in fuel loads. But there is a concern in the public, and I hear this a lot, that, in fact, there will be harvest for commercial, driven by commercial incentives rather than for real good thinning science. And I just wonder if you can tell us what measures have been adopted to date that we can tell the public to give them confidence that this is not being driven by commercial incentives rather than good science and thinning. And if you can address, I've heard some reports that we've dropped some of those requirements, like maximum diameter of harvest as well. Uh, maybe, maybe I could just take a, a start at uh, responding to that question. Uh, if you consider the, we know, the we huge need to keep a brief. Uh, Interrupt just for a moment. We need to keep it brief because I do want to give an opportunity to other members to ask a Great. question. Uh, we I'll be about quick. Ten uh, minutes. I believe if you talk about commercial harvest, commercial harvest is one tool to help us accomplish that, but it should not be the objective. The, the governor was perfect this morning. We talk about you know, what, can we, what do we need to leave on the landscape. That, that should be the, the starting point. And then what do we take off that is the important part of it. But how we take it off, we shouldn't constrain ourselves. Uh, we, we talk about diameter limits, and I, I appreciate the question, but I think we need to let that, that local prescription based on you know, what is good science, you know, what, you know, what do the, uh, the specialists tell us in terms of what needs to stay there? Let that drive the prescription. Don't, don't artificially, you know, constrain. I would also add that the prescription needs to be driven uh, by uh, conformance with local land use plans, and it, and it needs to be driven by local collaboration to find the appropriate solution. Well, we need to have a little more dialogue on this, and we want to defer. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I can put in two letters in the record by Mr. Udall, a unanimous consent request uh, uh, signed by 26 members uh, requesting environmental standards to be incorporated in any fire plan. No objection. Thank you, Mr. Honor. Chair. Uh, I might add that uh, the, the, the reductions that were just being talked about, it's my understanding, those are reductions for 2002. Your firefighting season that's coming up here in a few weeks is not suffering. There, there is no cut in firefighting operations. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I think the concern is historically what has happened, there's been a backloading of contingency in the, pre, in the next fiscal year. And what I'm suggesting is if this budget, we shouldn't fool ourselves. If the fires occur this year like they are likely to occur, we're going to be looking at another $500 million in the next fiscal year to make up your contingency funds. Isn't that a fair statement? Yes. You know, historically, we've, uh, our 10-year average would be about $423 million just on the Forest Service side right. in terms of suppression costs. Last year we were over a billion. Just as, as one Democratic modest partisan statement, this is the kind of issue we're concerned about in our tax cut vote today as well. Thank you. Well, let's, well I just want to make this clear because I don't want there to be a setup situation where a fire occurs and all of a sudden we hear from a slightly partisan point of view that uh, we didn't adequately fund the Forest Service. Let me repeat the question. You have been fully funded for the 2001 firefighting season. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Now, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lyle, Tim, welcome to the committee, and thank you for your testimony. I appreciate, Lyle, you keeping me informed of what's going on with the, uh, with the fire plan and, and the update of it. Uh, I was unaware that uh, commercial harvesting was actually a bad thing, but I know we do do some of that stuff, and it actually can be used to help prevent fires. But since we've had a slideshow today, let me just show you one slide, sh one slide show. <clears throat> this is what we're facing in Idaho. And while you can't predict an earthquake in uh, Seattle, I will guarantee you, you can predict one thing. This is going to burn. And it's going to burn very hot. And that's what we had last year on the Clear Creek Fire. And because we have not gone in and done 
the necessary thinning and so forth that goes on and that, that's necessary to reduce the uh, possibility of catastrophic wildfires. And I appreciate what you're doing in that area now and how we're going to be able to treat some of the lands and a few things like that. And actually, maybe some of them, we may actually commercially cut a tree. Who knows? Somebody might want a two by four in their house. But uh, tell me about the consultation process that's going on. Are we having problems with that between different agencies, with NEPA and, and uh, the NEPA process and other, other types of things? Uh, as I understand it, talking to some of the, some of the uh, local forest managers, uh, we've got more biologists from NIMPS on the ground uh, trying to, uh, trying to uh, have their, their say in what we're doing in these rehabilitation efforts and so forth. Uh, are we using the categorical, categorical exclusions? And even when we have used some of those, I understand that they've complained that we shouldn't have used them and so forth. Could you, could you talk to me a little bit about that? Just a very uh, quick response, Mr. Simpson. Uh, we're working right now with, uh, with Fish and Wildlife Service. Again, the funding for 2001 provided uh, funding to the agencies to support the NIMS and Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Section 7 consultation. Uh, we're working right now to, uh, to move that money over to uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service to do that. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service is probably going to hire an additional 100 biologists to do the Section 7 consultation work. Uh, the, the processes are, are really not a problem for us. It's just a matter of having the staff to complete the process, and I think the Congress recognized that with the funding. Well, let me ask just a follow-up. Is there something or anything that Congress needs to do to streamline this process so that we can actually do uh, some of these rehabilitation pro projects and so forth? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for asking that question. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're working on right now, in fact, Mr. McGinnis has given us some support, is uh, we have a bill that will provide us the, the legislative uh, mechanism that we can move those funds over to Fish and Wildlife Service. That's, that's a problem for us as, a, as an agency. And with that out of the way, We'll get that Section 7 consultation work done on uh, most of the 2002 projects. So it's, uh, that'll be a great help. Thank you. And thank you for all that you've done on this. Mr. Dan Credo. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lafferty, good to see you here today, sir. Uh, there are, uh, in, in the political world, in the elected political world, the um, presence of an individual uh, who has the courage of his commitments and uh, who lives up to them uh, is somewhat rare. In the bureaucratic world, uh, it is even more rare, I think. You are an exception to that rule. You, from my point of view, are an individual who does have the courage of his convictions and has expressed them um, articulately, not just here today, but uh, in, in my, the history, the brief history I've had with you, uh, that has been my observation. And I just wanted to essentially thank you very much for uh, being a, a strong supporter of good forest management, even when that support uh, could get you into trouble. The um, question I have for you is, although I am encouraged by everything you've said in terms of the appropriations that have been made available to the agencies to uh, suppress uh, fire and uh, to fight it, the I am concerned about the degree to which you may be facing other obstacles, that is to say, um, more bureaucratic, more regulatory in nature. And if you could, sir, and if, if there isn't time today to complete your answer in a definitive way, even if you could submit uh, to us some response in paper, on paper, uh, that would be fine. I'm, I'm interested in the Clean Air Act, NEPA, endangered species, roadless area, that sort of thing, where you may have all of the equipment now, you may have all of the firefighters in place, but not be able to do the job because of the regulatory burden. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tancredo, one of, the, uh, one of the actions that uh, Tim and I have been working with uh, CEQ is to actually go out and do some field reviews in terms of the work processes that are going on with NEPA. We believe that there are some opportunities just for us to examine closely what we do and how we go about doing that work. We think there are some efficiencies to be gained there. In fact, uh, Dinah Bear from uh, CEQ has been very open with us about helping us uh, you know, find those ways that we can, can actually make NEPA work more effectively for us. Um, I, I think those kinds of findings will help us integrate you know, really a tapestry of laws that we all deal with. And between the laws and regulations, we need to figure out how can we make those things work effectively for us. And, and many times, uh, 
you know, training is, is a key tool to help people understand here's what you have to do. Uh, and perhaps we're doing many times more than we really need to do. Uh, but I think as we go through those kinds of field reviews, we can, we can learn from that and then make those adaptive changes in terms of our work processes to, to be more effective and efficient in terms of responding to the situation that we have. You know, I look forward to hearing from you on, along those lines. Uh, Congressman, uh, Lyle and I also have an interdepartmental environmental compliance group uh, that, that has members from both departments and other agencies that meets on a regular basis to look at uh, existing regulations and procedures to make sure that there aren't any roadblocks uh, any, uh, in the process to help us be efficient. Let me just say that I, I right now, from our perspective, don't see any problems uh, in meeting our fuels reduction uh, acres because of uh, uh, regulations and environmental compliance. But one area we are interested in is possibly getting uh, categorical exclusion status for rehab projects because they clearly are emergency in nature. Yeah. Thank you both, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Otter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Surprise. Uh, I've got just a couple of questions, and I know Lyle and Tim, we've talked an awful lot about this, and I appreciate the time that you've spent with me as the bottom of the political food chain and being a freshman it, it, uh, <laughs> that you've given me an awful lot of time. But there's a couple of things that I would like to ask you. Number one, where does the money go if we should actually get a return on a harvest? Where does that money go? Uh, on the Forest Service side, those receipts go to the General Treasury. And so wouldn't, couldn't that then be used to help uh, fund uh, future firefighting and, and also future planning and rehabilitation and uh, your five-point program? It, it goes into the, you know, to the big mix of the uh, issues that you're dealing with on the floor today. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. I think that's interesting because it seems to me that uh, if you'll recall, and historically speaking, uh, the Panhandle, the Clearwater, and the Payette uh, practically burned in total. Uh, in 1914, right? And then it was re replaced by a, an invasive species or two, uh, one fur and one a white pine. And their life cycle is about 90 years. Is that not right? Uh, a lot of the lodge poles, um, 90 to 120 years, yes, yeah. sir. We're at the threshold right now. My point is this. We're at the threshold right now. And if you locked yourself into a management plan that said simply we're going to do this for fire prevention, and we're at that threshold of 90-year life for those trees right now today, wouldn't it be reasonable to go in and clear-cut that if you were only uh, going to go fire prevention? Because they're going to die, and then they're dead, and then they're fuel. Well, I think the, uh, maybe the, the short answer is that uh, depending on the situation, you want to take the right tool for that silvicultural treatment. It may or may not be a clear-cut. I, I liken it to uh, if you were a cabinet maker, you want to have the right tool for that job. And uh, I think it's the same, same way it's true in terms of coming up with a silvicultural prescription, depending on the outcome and the objectives that you're searching for, you want to, take the, you want to use that right tool. In some cases, it could be a clear cut. My point is this. If they were thinned over a management period of time, allowing the trees a, a larger basal base uh, per acre, uh, wouldn't there be a lot less likely to have a fire, a devastating fire, a clear burn, let me say? One of the, one of the issues, and I think the, uh, the Lick Creek photo series that we showed uh, indicates the, the changes that are taking place in those stand structures. And when you do, in fact, have that density of stands, that's when you, you know, invite uh, insects, you invite uh, various types of disease as well. So you know, keeping those stand conditions in, those, in a healthy functioning capacity you know, provides benefits not only general forest health, but I think uh, you know, the whole watershed systems have begun to function effectively. Okay, and one final question, if I might, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is there any chance that you can train the Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and uh, National Marines Fishery people that are on the ground out there to fight fire? Uh, we, we get a lot of people from uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has crews, and I, I, we've used, uh, I'm not sure if we use Corps of Engineer people, but... Uh, uh, we have a lot of interagency teams that, uh, that bring people from all the agencies together. There, so cross-training is possible? Oh, absolutely. There's nothing yes, precluding that. Uh, as long as they meet our rigid physical standards and they uh, take the training, they can participate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think the ranking member has one question they'd like to ask. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'll tell you a concern I have 
concern is that we're going to repeat some mistakes of the past. Uh, our, our fire suppression policies has resulted in accumulation of fuel loads that have resulted in some of these catastrophic fires. I think that's abundantly clear. My concern is that when we get into some cataclysmic fires, which we may be in back in that season again this year, that it will remove us from a long-term goal of getting back to a situation where fire is part of the natural cycle and we accept it as part of the natural cycle and we recognize that fire is necessary for a healthy ecosystem in the long term. These ponderosa pines developed with fire and the only reason they're healthy is with fire. And I guess the question is how do we how do we keep the twin goal of not allowing property damage in the West, but realizing a long-term goal, which I think should be, and you tell me if it is, of getting to a point where we can accept fire as part of the natural ecosystem and a necessary part of one? Uh, Mr. Isley, I, I believe that the, um, that the fire plan, the, the objectives, are very, very consistent with what you described. But our challenge is how do we you know, make those investments to bring that landscape back to that kind of a condition. And because, as we talked earlier, we have excluded fire from these landscapes for such a long time, we're no longer in the position because of the long-term effects of just letting nature take its course. Um, in, in Colorado, we have an example of a fire that burned four years ago. And uh, that fire, it cost Denver Water Board $12 million to clear the uh, sediment out of a watershed, the reservoir, because of the, the rain that came after that. It burned with such an intensity that we, we actually changed the structure of the soil. Uh, it's going to take literally centuries for that to recover. Uh, the loss is not only in the function of that watershed, but at the same time we've lost the productive capacity of species habitat. And I believe that uh, the goals that we have for the fire plan will allow us to begin making those kinds of treatments where we can keep fire in a more natural role that it plays on many of these landscapes across the interior west. However, that's not a simple answer because we now have this huge influx of people that want to live in the same type of a fire adapted ecosystem. So the introduction of the human component makes that, uh, that challenge much, much more difficult. Well, let, me, let me just quickly add that long term fuels hazard management is the answer. Uh, it gives us options. It lowers fire intensity. It gives our firefighters more options then uh, in when they do initial attack and respond to the fire. And, and that generally results in you know, fewer resources and lower costs being needed for suppression. I, I would love to take you out and show you some of, the, uh, some of the areas where we've done some treatments on the ground. But I think we can show you exactly what happens in terms of changing fire effects in treated stands. And, uh, and it can be done in such an environmentally sensitive fashion that it really does accomplish, I think, uh, the items that you've shared with us. And I appreciate your comments. Thank you. I appreciate that response and the fact that fire is a natural part of the ecosystem and will always be. And we're never going to put out all fires, nor should we put out all fires. But there are differences between catastrophic fires. Uh, we have in Idaho places from the 1910 fire that where, the, where the soil is still, still sterile and nothing grows on it because it was so hot that it burned it. How far down was it? 18 inches. 18 18 inches. Calcine. Just, yes. yeah. So anyway, I appreciate that. I'd like to close this hearing today by taking a look at the weather, as was mentioned by the ranking member. Both below, below normal precipitation to date throughout much of the western and southeastern states indicate that we may be in for a big fire season again this summer. This makes it essential that, uh, this makes it essential that time is used wisely and efficiently in the near term for preparing for the thousands of newly hired firefighters because if we don't adequately train and equip those people, we are unjustly putting them in, in, in life-threatening positions, which of course is unacceptable. In the long term, we are looking at 73 million acres of Forest Service lands that are at high risk of catastrophic fires, more than a third of the national forest system. It will be a daunting task to reduce the hazards on these and other federal lands, but a task we must accomplish. So the subcommittee will continue in its bipartisan effort to scrutinize these and all other aspects of the National Fire Plan as it is implemented. I look forward to working with you uh, as we work on this endeavor to make sure that we can address this issue. Uh, does the ranking member have a closing statement? Thank you very much. Uh, I thank the witnesses on the second panel for their insight and the members for their questions. The members of the subcommittee may have uh, some additional questions. Uh, for the witnesses, and uh, we ask that you please respond to these in writing. The, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days for these responses. I'd like to thank Mike Williams of the subcommittee staff for his excellent work on this hearing. Uh, if there's no further business before the subcommittee,
The chairman again thanks the members of the subcommittee and our witnesses. The subcommittee stands adjourned. Here's a look at the schedule through tomorrow morning.